Okay. Um, I do run co-chair and co-founded the MFA Designer as Author and Entrepreneur program. And for the last 20 years, we've been putting ventures out into the world. Some of them work. Some of them don't work. Some of them shouldn't ever work. Uh, some of them should work, but the technology's not there. Some of them should work, but the money's not there. So if you have money, tell me about it. <laughs> My email is available. But uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, uh, first of all, this is my son, Nick. He's a filmmaker. I always wanted to be a filmmaker, so best, best that he is one. I'm very proud that he has this tattoo on his back uh, by Christoph Nyman. I grew up only a few blocks east of here. Uh, I learned self-defense very quickly. Uh, I wanted desperately to be uh, an Air Force general, and then the Vietnam War came and I went to the School of Visual Arts. Uh, I was kicked out because I worked for underground uh, newspapers, left-wing papers. Uh, the one that has those lovely looking fellows there, they were called agent provocateur, they're police who would go into demonstrations and disrupt. And uh, except for the one guy in the middle sticking his tongue out who was not a cop and sued us for quite a bit of money. Uh, the other problem we had was uh, being a political paper we could only sell when we put nudes on the front page. Uh, we got most of our nude pictures from this woman. Does anybody know who she is? Yayoi Kusama. She was a crazy person. And she would call me every morning and say, I got good naked picture for you. And then I found that she had three shows at the Museum of Modern Art. Go figure. Um, I was also the art director of Screw. The one that looks like uh, real crap was my first. I knew nothing about design. This is how I got taught design. This is how I taught myself design. Uh, I looked at a lot of annuals. I looked at a lot of people. Uh, I actually had Milton Glaser design the logo for Screw. He didn't design this particular version, he, but he did do the E that seems to be going erect. It's symbolic, folks. Uh, I added the shadow. Um, the guy in the tuxedo is me. Uh, I published at the age of 17 uh, a magazine called the New York Review of Sex. It was supposed to be the classy version of the porn revolution. Uh, today, this morning at 6 a.m., I went to get global entry in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, the guy, the customs guy said, have you ever been arrested or fingerprinted? And I said, yes. He said, I know. Uh, we have it here in the computer. You were arrested twice, and uh, we need to know whether, uh, what it was for. And I said, pornography. <laughs> and he said, pornography, that's good. Uh, you're allowed one misdemeanor every 10 years to get global entry. I had two misdemeanors, but they went over 30, 40 years, so I was OK. Uh, I also was the art director of Rock magazine, uh, which was a rock and roll uh, wannabe uh, Rolling Stone. And I was one of the first designers for uh, Interview magazine. Those of you who are typographers in the room, how many of you are typographers or consider yourself such? None? Well, then I can't sell any books to you. Um, but you don't put Broadway and Bussarama together. And I worked for the East Village Other, which was not too far away from here. This was a hotbed, by the way. Just walked down 10 blocks to the East Village, and everything was happening. Fillmore East, Anderson Theater, major rock groups. It was a great time. I'll tell you about it sometime when I'm in my wheelchair. And I also did this magazine called The Ace, which took the uh, East Village Other eye and smashed it. Did a magazine called Mobster Times, which was all about political crime. It would it has certainly not lost its uh, touch. Uh, it was about the Nixon era, but uh, now we long for the Nixon era. And from there, I got my job at the New York Times. Uh, I was the art director for the op-ed page for a number of years and the art director of the book review for 30 years. And it was uh, one of the joys of my life. But what I've come to tell you and admit to you is that I'm an addict. And these are some of the meds that I use. Without these meds, I would look like this. 
because my addictions are basically in this particular picture. My addictions are graphic design. My addictions are the artifacts of design that tell the history and bring out the legacy and the heritage of design. And I've written, edited, or co-edited and co-written over 172 books over the last 35 years. Uh, and just as many introductions for other people's books. Uh, my son made a little film of uh, uh, what my man cave looked like. Uh, you may not be able to see it all that well, but all I can tell you is it's very dark, dreary, and I had a load of fun with it. but this music is even depressing me at the moment, so uh, this is what he was shooting. Uh, the addictions that I have include posters and uh, what are called mini mannequins, uh, design reference books and journals, uh, product mascots, and as I just said, mini mannequins, which are about yay high, and uh, they look like yay high mannequins, except they're not, they're yay high. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them there in a, in a bit. There are also uh, counter displays for consumer goods. I believe uh, that graphic design, which is the child of advertising, uh, is important to know the history of because it tells us a lot about our culture. Our culture of design has changed considerably in the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, the more we know about what did happen and how it evolved through printing and through uh, advertising, uh, the more excited I think people can get about the form. Uh, graphic design comes from everywhere and every place. This room is full of graphic design. And I collect ads, tins, boxes, and displays. I find just about any kind of artifact a reason for telling a story. I write every day. I have a daily blog called The Daily Heller that Print Magazine sponsors. I used to have a column for the New York Times and the New York Times Book Review. And so these objects of design that come from the early to mid 20th century to the late 20th century are very key elements because advertising was placed everywhere. Anybody who's working on websites now knows that advertising is this strange netherworld, not quite sure how to monetize it, not quite sure where to put it, uh, not quite sure who looks at it. But when things were on, on uh, pieces of paper, remember paper, they come from trees, um, they were embraceable, they were tactile, they were something that you could smell, touch, feel, even eat. Uh, and looking at the way corporations develop their graphic identity is something that I have been very interested in. The way Kodak went from something like this, which was Mondrian inspired, meaning it went back to the art world, to the avant-garde art world, uh, and came up to the present with its orange and red uh, uh, color scheme, and now it's out of business, uh, thanks to the digital, all of you. Um, <laughs> Every time I get a number of uh, things together that uh, seem to have a thematic continuity, I create a book. I work with a lot of collaborators, including my wife, Louise Feely, who is a wonderful designer. And she created, uh, we did 15, 16 books together, including this one, Euro Deco, which is a compilation of a lot of the Art Deco materials I just showed you. Um, each one of these books, we have eight of them, and this is a compilation of, of six of them, have women on the cover because she wanted women on the cover and she's a woman. So there you go. Um, I am very interested, in a, as I said, in these mannequin things, which I call sculptures of commerce. They're, they're pieces that capture your eye and bring you into a product, bring you into a consumable. Some people are down on consumerism. Some people are down on capitalism. I'm down on most everything. But I enjoy the consumption experience, and I enjoy, enjoy what leads to the consumption experience, the tease, the foreplay. And these things were uh, used as foreplay. In fact, my wife can't stand the one here. 
uh, and she's been exiled to my office, which is over on 2nd Avenue and 22nd Street, because she just thinks it's disgusting to have a torso in the living room. Uh, these are some other items. You'll see political things mixed in with purely commercial things because my life is on one side political, very left-wing political. My other part of the life is capitalist, consumerist, rooted through, looked at through the design lens. And it's looked at through the design lens because there's an inherent beauty in the things that have been used that designers have made, anonymous and well-known designers, to sell products. So again, once I got enough of these mini mannequins, and there are about 100 of them, we created a book called Counterculture. Uh, in fact, the photographer of all these things was a Times photographer who I uh, held prisoner for four months in the room that you saw earlier and let him out only to go to work. Uh, typography. This is one of the things that anybody who is a designer has to be passionate about because it's our lingua franca. Uh, this is a little movie that one of my students did based on a book that I'll show you in a second. What I love about type is that it has a voice, it has personality. You can find just about any typeface or piece of lettering to express what you want to say, what you want somebody to hear and see. Uh, type, like music, comes in many shapes, colors, tones, and timbers. And so the book that uh, my wife and I created was Typology, which is a span and scan of uh, display typography. Display typography is something I appreciate more than the reading typography, the text typography, book typography, the things that are supposed to be neutral. I don't like neutrality. I like in your face. And so I've made collections of the in your face types, including shadow, for example, uh, because it gives a sense of dimensionality. It's like the trompe l'oeil of typography. It gives illumination uh, and adds depth and volume. And once I had a bunch of these together, uh, Louise and I produced a book called Shadow Type. This is part of a series of four books, all starting with the letter S. So we call it the S series. Uh, another S is the stencil. The stencil was really the first kind of display face. It wasn't movable, so Gutenberg can't take any credit for it, but it was cut by hand uh, by craftspeople who were totally uh, anonymous, and these were used to mark up packages and bags and bushels and things uh, before there was real branding. So this is the beginning of branding. Uh, this is branding from the uh, 1950s. Paul Rand, some of you may know who he is, a great American graphic designer. He used the stencil for El Producto because it was very similar to the kind of stencil that would be put on a, a bushel of tobacco when uh, it reached its uh, manufacturing source. So we did a book called Stencil Type. This is a avant-garde magazine. I'm sure many of you uh, go on the web and s search around for things and go to clubs and go to galleries and do all of that. These avant-garde magazines were indeed the clubs, the internet, the blogs, uh, the tweeter, the tweaks, the Instagrams of their day, of the 20s and 30s. And I made a huge collection of the different ones. They're all radical forms of art and design. And uh, some were political, some were purely artistic. And the book that came out of it was called From Mares to Emigre and Beyond. I wanted to call it unacceptable because the publications were indeed unacceptable. But that title was unacceptable to the publisher, so fuck them. <laughs> Uh, I love magazines. I grew up in magazines. I was born around magazines. There was a magazine stand right next to where my mother gave birth to me. Uh, I think that's what I got first, and then I got her milk. I preferred the magazine. Um, das Plakat is a magazine about posters that was published in the uh, teens. 
Uh, De Reclama is a magazine about advertising. As I said, advertising is the mother of graphic design. And uh, when you look at ma these magazines, you see all the different possibilities that were going around at any given time in history that were used by printers who were the parent, was the father of graphic design uh, to create auras that would attract people's eyes. The Reclama means advertising. And that became a book uh, that I did with Jason Godfrey of 100 magazines, uh, design magazines, classic magazines. We could have done another 100. There are just so many of them. I enjoy people. I've done maybe 500 to 600 interviews, uh, published interviews, many on the internet. Um, with designers, this happens to be Paul Rand, who I knew very well, and uh, I did the penultimate interview I with him it. before he but passed away. But there was something away. very deep and genuine about the old stuff. Uh, you know, I still look admiringly uh, at, the, at, the, at the collages of, of Brock and Picasso, just pieces of newspaper and some lines of charcoal, and I try to figure out why does this stuff look so terrific even today? I mean, I don't know why. A sense of freedom, perhaps? Yeah, so that was me. Um, Paul Rand was one of a few designers, modernist designers, who brought art into design, B was influenced by the artistic movements of Europe uh, after World War I and before the Nazis uh, or the Trumpites took over. Uh, he created advertising campaigns when he worked for an advertising agency called Weintraub that were truly delightful. Uh, he also was known as a corporate designer and the IBM logo is his. Uh, he started out where this was just bold type, city bold, done by a designer by the name of Trump. <laughs> and. Uh, he would always joke around with why this, he did the scan lines. It was actually to push the black back and give also a mnemonic uh, to the viewer. So the viewer would remember the, the initials even more than just the initials themselves. And he did the same with uh, Westinghouse. Westing, he, the way he designed or redesigned logos was to take the existing one and tweak them ever so slightly or ever so much to make them more modern. And in the case of Westinghouse, it started as a W with a lozenge underneath in a circle. What he did was add the little schematic balls, which people could interpret any way they wanted. It was a clown's face, it was a king's crown. Uh, uh, it was anything, and that's the way it should be, because however you have it in your mind, it becomes memorable. So I did a biography, a professional biography of Rand. Um, it's not a full-fledged biography because there were lots of secrets that I know he didn't want to uh, leave out in the open and he took to the grave with him. So if anybody wants to do a more in-depth biography, I'll tell you all those secrets. Um, this is Alvin Lustig, another modernist, a great modernist who was known for his book jackets at first, very beautifully done, influenced by modern art, in this case, Mark Rothko. He experimented wildly with photography and, and typography. Um, he died when he was 45, so I thought it would be an easier book to do, because how much work could you do up until 45? Uh, and he went blind when he was 43. I won't play this clip for you, but it's his w wife who just passed away talking about doing his work at his instruction uh, when he was blind and not really knowing whether he was doing what she had, he told her to do. He uh, designed covers that are just beautiful today. This Fortune magazine cover is a gem, and no pun intended. But he was also an industrial designer. He was a Renaissance man. He created a helicopter that I would never go in in, <laughs> in your body. But um, it looked very much like his chairs. And he also did architecture, even though he had no architecture training, no architecture degree. He uh, used an architect with it. And that became my book, Born Modern, that I did with his widow, uh, Elaine Lustig-Cohen. This is a book that's coming out in the fall 
Uh, I won't go into detail why this is coming out uh, late in the, the game in terms of my own history, but I never liked designers who use geometry. And then all of a sudden I fell in love with designers who did geometry, simplicity, uh, and had a certain amount of eloquence that were influenced by the Bauhaus and influenced by other avant-gardisms. And so uh, with Greg D'Onofrio, uh, a, a colleague of mine, we did this book which features 64 modern designers from 1939 to 1970. Uh, this is George Cherney. And these are some pages. So Joseph Albers uh, was one of those designers. George Giusti, Robert Brownjohn, uh, Rudy Deharic, whose work really was the spawned this book. I just fell in love with this stuff, even though I had a bias against it up until a few years ago. And we have a few women in it as well. There weren't that many women in design at the time. Uh, and this is Lillian Baseman, who designed Junior Bazaar. Uh, I'm fascinated with signs and symbols, as we all should be, because they control our minds. They, you know, the make America great again uh, on that silly hat of his uh, captured a lot of imaginations, just as the swastika did for some other people. Uh, but Coca-Cola used it. This was the Corn Palace in South Dakota. The Girls Club of America used it and even had a, ma uh, a magazine devoted to it. And, of course, these people used it. And these people are still using it and are coming back into vogue, sadly enough. So I did a book called The Swastika, Symbol Beyond Redemption. The thing that scared me the most living only a few blocks away is that every other Friday there were air raid drills and we had to get under our desks and put our heads between our legs and kiss our asses goodbye. Uh, or we went to a fallout shelter. So th this is the kind of graphic design that I saw on a daily basis that scared the crap out of me. This was the first anti-nuke image done by Robert Osborne after Hiroshima, and this is an anti-H-bomb image that says a lot in its abstract but quite vivid expressionist quality. And this is one of my favorite clips from a, a film that says it all. Not the best actor, but really a great scene. And that became a book called Red Scared. Uh, my, one of my most recent books, I do maybe three or four, sometimes five a year, and these are some of the collaborators that I've worked with. I love working with other people, uh, as long as they know their place. Uh, <laughs> And this is what that room now, uh, well, doesn't look like that anymore because they made it an Airbnb, but that's what happened. Uh, and I thank you very much. I've overshot. Should I sit down? Oh, wait, there's somebody that got to the mic before you. I'm sorry. Oh, what? So I just love the way you describe your life and what kind of physical objects you create. That's something you only look at to the way you see it. And it's a question for you. What do you think of your future illustration plan and ways of are you taking screenshots for your social media? You know, sometimes I do, actually. But they're paper, and I, 50% of everything I do now is done for the web. Uh, and, and I've become addicted to it, just as we all have to look at our phones every 22 seconds. I have to see how many likes I got on an article. I ha my son calls me and says, I've got 90,000 followers. What about you, Dad? Uh, and he does. He's gotten a lot of gigs, film gigs, through all of that. So the world has changed. Uh, I'm glad I'll be dead soon. And, uh, you know, our, our, my students work in this environment and speak in this language. And uh, there are some amazing things, but I'm not ready to write the history about of it yet.
Meredith. So, first of all, you have been here, so I'm pleased. But perhaps you could talk a little bit about our topic here today and evolutions of Alzheimer's. Well, when the web started, uh, what was it, Mosaic? It was like, this is for real. And then there was bitmap type, which seemed like Etch-a-Sketch. And then there was uh, you know, high-res laser. And then the world just changed. Uh, so you know, it, for me, it's just adapting to new forms, new tools. Uh, the typefaces that are being done now uh, for web only and for uh, use in the different mobile first, of course. Uh, there's a whole different sensibility that has to go into that. But my wife, for example, designed two wood typefaces. They're in wood, but they're also digitized. And people buy them as digital faces. They buy the wood for the tactility of having wood, or if they have presses. I think what uh, there's, I'd like to say something terrible about what's going on on the web, but I can't. Uh, Hmm? No, no, I actually like what's going on. <laughs> I know I, it's hard to believe me, because my sincerity quotient is not as high as it should be. But I like any form of communication that uses letter forms. So if those letter forms are made by hand, I've done six or seven books that are just called sketchbooks. Uh, they're by T Thames and Hudson has published them and a new one called Freehand is coming out, and it's just sketches, people doing drawings. Many of these type designers and typographers put them into a digital form, and they're, they're at least sold on the web, if not used on web. So, um, you know, long live it all. And what's more, if it didn't live, none of you would have jobs, and I support jobs. Thank you.